Hello, good morning. Welcome to the Sunday Supplement. Coming up on today's show, Jose's at war with Chelsea again. Maurizio Sarri's assistants celebrated their 96th minute equaliser in front of the Manchester United manager at Stamford Bridge yesterday. Shad Khan, he's pulled out of the £600 million purchase of Wembley. What does it mean for the future of English football? And, whisper it, is the quiet revolution underway at Arsenal as they aim to make it 10 in a row under Unai Emery tomorrow against Leicester. Three luminaries with us this morning. Martin Samuel is the chief sports writer at the, Mail on, at the Daily Mail. Rory, <laughs> <Lovely>. almost. <laughs> Rory Smith is the chief soccer correspondent at the New York Times. And Sam Wallace is the chief football writer at the Telegraph. Morning, guys. Good to see you. Uh, don't forget to tweet the show at Sunday Sup. The best will appear on your screen over the next 90 minutes. Let's have a look at the papers then. The Mail on Sunday. Jose at war after one of the Chelsea coaches yesterday ran in front of him celebrating Chelsea's 96-minute equaliser at Stamford Bridge. It's across all the papers, as you'd expect this morning. Uh, the Sunday Times leading with it as well. Take that, Jose. The site back page of The Sun as well, headlines with. So, Sarri, Jose, Chelsea's apology to Mourinho yesterday after that fracas. Good story here from Steve Bates on the back of the Sunday people. Shut up. This is Manchester United telling their ambassadors, their match day legends in the lounges, that they're not allowed to criticise Mourinho. They've had some bad results there at uh, Old Trafford recently. The Telegraph's campaign to save grassroots football. This began at the start of the week. Time for action, it continues today. This is Sam's paper, the grassroots game in danger of decay. This is the former sports minister, Andy Burnham, talking in The Telegraph this morning. Eden Hazard about to hit the jackpot. That's the jackpot, that's the back page of The Express this morning. £300,000 a week, his new contract, according to The T Express this morning. Sunday Mirror, it's bye-bye. Saudis politically sensitive and delicate, this story. The Saudis ready to launch £4 billion takeover of Manchester United. Is it really goodbye to this man, Raheem Sterling, on the substitutes bench from Manchester City yesterday? Big win for them, but is he really on his way out? According to the Sunday Mirror, he is over that contract story. Joe Hart, not a good return to it. The Etihad yesterday, Burnley beaten 5-0 by Manchester City. We're going to start, though, where else? But Stamford Bridge, Martin. Mm -hmm. um, should we talk about the game? Yeah, well, <laughs> do whatever you'd like, mate. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's only one place show. to start, isn't it? Let's, let's, um, let's talk about Mourinho, let's talk about the situation at, at the end of the game and mm -hmm. what happened, how it happened, the chronology of the events leading up to Barclays' equaliser and then what happened next. Well, Chelsea equalised mm. uh, six minutes into injury time, which... Uh, um, is never a happy moment for the uh, manager on the receiving end of that. A Chelsea assistant, second assistant coach, uh, whether he's the assistant to the first coach or uh, I don't know who he's the assistant yeah. to, he's the second assistant coach, runs down from what looks to be the second row. He's not actually in the front row. He, he, so he sort of... And then he runs along the touchline and gives it a little bit to the Manchester United bench. And then he runs back and stops in front of the Manchester United bench, stops specifically in front of Marino, looks as if he sticks it uh, to Marino, who jumps up out of his seat and uh, tries to uh, explain the error of his ways to him um, <laughs> and uh, is restrained by several stewards, one guy in, a, in an orange hive-vis, who I presume is more important than the guys in the yellow hive-vis. <laughs> I don't know if there's a, a whole hive-vis league, league table there might be, I don't know. Is he the second assistant? Yeah, behind him was probably the sec second assistant orange hive-vis and, and he was the, yeah. the, 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 the high hive-vis, as they say. And, um, and he restrains him, and then Sarri comes over and, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, sort of uh, bonding. And I think it is explained to Sarri what has happened. After the match, there's some suggestion that, that, that Marino asked for the guy to come and see him. Uh, whether that's true or not, uh, I'm, I'm unsure. Mm. Um, that that is, hasn't been confirmed, but that, that seems to be the suggestion. But Sarri certainly said sorry to Marino, and he certainly said I'll get the I'll get Marco Yanni to uh, apologise as well, and that is what happened. Mm. Marino then gave a press conference in which he talked about education, as he often does in these in, in these circumstances. And did you uh, think that was a deliberate word that he used? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he said it once about he used it about Cristiano Ronaldo once mm. as well, didn't he? And um, and he uh, also uh, said that he's been a young coach and he's made mistakes and, 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 and all of that. And so he said that Chelsea were wrong, uh, which they were. Um, 
that notwithstanding, you don't have to react. And what is interesting from here is how the Football Association see it, bearing in mind there is a, there is a precedent involving Arsene Wenger and Alan Pardew, mm -hmm. um, which is admittedly quite an old one. It's 2006 the incident now. But that was a late. That was a very late goal. It was well, Marlon Harewood goal. Yeah. Uh, you know, so uh, it was. I think it was unexpected to the everybody. Not, not, not just not just to the two managers. I don't think anyone in the stadium was really expecting it. Uh, it was a Marlon Harewood winner for West Ham against Arsenal. Mm. Um, very very late in the game, Wenger's claim was that sort of Pardew overstepped the mark and, and and sort of celebrated either in front of the Arsenal bench or stuck it to the Arsenal bench. Marge got accused of that a few times in, mm. his, in his career, that his celebrations were sometimes a little bit so, shall we say, inclusive of the other team. Um, and, but that ended in a sort of pushing and shoving and a bit of swearing, and Wenger left without giving a press conference mm. and all of this sort of stuff. The interesting thing is the aftermath of it, which is that there was no action taken against Pardew. He was charged, but there was actually no action taken against him. He was, he was cleared of, of, of the charge of improper conduct. Wenger was fined £10,000 mm. uh, and warned about his future conduct. Um, and whether that had then had an, a, an impact when he was eventually banned from the touchline for four matches, wasn't he, a number of years later. Yep. So that's the interesting thing is that the, the FA precedent Goes against Marino, who you got to remember is already on a on a, on a charge, a touchline charge, yep. which he's got until Wednesday to. So it just depends how the FA see this, whether they see it as similar to that situation, or whether they think that because everyone has at the end shook hands and kissed and made up, you know, yeah. it's gone away. So where, what will, what action will the FA take? Do you think, if any, um, <clears throat> what should or what should they take? Uh, I think it's probably. Probably a letter, isn't it? And warned about future conduct. I, I don't think. I mean, there's something a bit depressing about grown men grappling and <laughs> with each other live on national television. I think it, it was. It's um, almost happened here. <laughs> <a couple of> times. <laughs> it was. Uh, I think. I think what really got Marino was is the question of hierarchy. I mean, he wouldn't even known who this guy was, yes, and um, here he is, the man who, who won three titles at Chelsea over the years, being. Um, well, someone sort of attempting to ridicule him on what was once, you know, his home turf. And he actually, <clears throat> when he did it the first time, I mean, he went past the first time, the United bench, you could see them thinking, well, that was a bit naughty, but we'll let that one go. Mm. And when he did it the second time, it felt inevitable. I mean, I was watching him, it was right in front of the press box, and I watched him come back and thought, he's surely not going to do it again, and, and he did. <laughs> um, the interesting thing about it is also is Marino's relationship with Chelsea, because he is their most successful manager ever. And when the history of the club is, you know, is written, he is a key part in it. But they have quite an uneasy relationship with him. Uh, you know, in 20 years' time, they'll they'll wheel him out and he'll wave to the crowd, and everyone, everything will be forgotten. It will be fine. And this is the guy that that, that won the, the the first, the second, the club's second ever title on their hundredth anniversary, and it, it'll be. But at the moment, it's still very raw. And what Chelsea hate is Marino being able to take the, the moral high ground, and yeah. and he absolutely did that, and justifiably so. Mm. And there was a lot of finger wagging in that press conference, and um, proverbial rather than or metaphorical sure. rather than literal. And that really gets their goat because it was a very, very, a very, very difficult end to his second tenure, and he's come back. And I'm afraid they are in the wrong on this one. It's not a big deal, but they are in the wrong, and, and that's a bit painful for them. Does it? Does that relationship matter, Rory? Is it? it Sam, it, Sam feels it's a little bit sad that it's come it, that it's come to that, and one day relationship will be, will be will thaw, and they'll be a lot better, and it'll be a lot warmer. Does it, does it, at this moment in time, does it matter? It's very rare that I say this, but I, th I think Sam's wrong. I think in 20 years' time, Mourinho won't be wheeled out at Chelsea. I think in a previous era, a previous generation, he would have been. But there's something shifted in the nature of, of sort of football fandom, I think. One of those great romantic things that you used to see all the time was the former player coming back with another team, still active, and he'd always get sort of a 15, 20-minute kind of grace period almost, where he could kind of do anything, and the fans would be like, oh, it's nice mm. to see, and this is lovely. That doesn't happen anymore. As soon as as soon as players leave, they're kind of they're cut out of history. Same with managers. So I don't I don't think Mourinho will be invited back, and that's a real shame for everything that he's 
contributed to the club. And Mourinho's not an easy figure to love if you're not actively supporting his current team. Yeah. And I think part of the problem, maybe for Chelsea fans, is that he seems to have claimed those league titles as his own, not as things he won with Chelsea, things he won and Chelsea were kind of around as well. The rest of the players sort of played a part, but really it was about Jose. That doesn't make it easy to kind of be attached to, to those three league championships, just he's claimed them as his own. But I, I don't see any kind of sense amongst the fans almost. that, that things, he's... Why has the landscape yeah, things changed, don't they? I mean, Chelsea fans, and let's not make any bones about it, used to racially abuse Paul Cannonville in the 1980s. Not all of them, but some of them. He comes back now and there's real remorse. I mean, mm. and a lot of the people in the stadium, you know, we should absolve them of guilt, but in Paul Cannonville has said himself, he was Chelsea's first black player, has said, people have come up to me and said, I said some um, horrible things to you in the 1980s and now I'd like to apologise. So I think the passage of time does heal. I totally get what you're saying. I think it's weird the way that someone like... There's, there's a whole generation of United fans who don't seem to understand what Mark Hughes meant to the club at a certain time. <laughs> I mean, which just, to me is just kind of unbelievable, really. But, but you're right that people do have shorter memories. I just think, I'm going to give it 20 years, <laughs> okay. all right? 20 years. When you, little old did, Jose comes back, I think he'll be fine. Did Mourinho not... Wasn't one of his first games with Manchester United, or quite an early game, was against Chelsea? And I seem to have a recollection. It was right at the start of the season. That he, he, was, was, he was trying to sign Rooney at the time. That he was he? quite outspoken. Yes, he was trying to... Yeah, yeah, he was quite outspoken. Uh, or Chelsea. Uh, yes, no, but one of his so. first games at Manchester United, he was, he was quite outspoken about Chelsea and the fact. And it seemed as if, it seemed to me, as if he used that, he used the, the sort of press conferences around that time to forge a bond with the Manchester United fans. Mm. That he basically was quite, I can't remember what, he, what aspect of Chelsea he was quite critical of, but he was quite dismissive about certain things to do with Chelsea. And it was almost as if he was going, right, I'm your guy now, I'm not their guy, don't think I'm going back there and there's a part of me that, that still wants to be their guy, I'm your guy. And I think that was, that was the beginning of it. That was the beginning of this sort of... Was that, the game at Stanford, was that the game at Stanford Bridge, Martin, when he came off the pitch and he was, he was patting his Manchester United it, it jacket? Might, it might have been something like that, but there was stuff, yeah, there, and there Stanford was stuff, Bridge. yeah, they did, they got beat about 4-0, didn't they, mm. or something like that, but they, 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 but certainly even before that, in the build-up to it, he had wound things up with Chelsea, almost as a, as a way of bringing himself closer to, to, to Manchester United and to their support, and he's still very close to them, because... They sing his name, you know, throughout the game, basically. Mm. Yeah. Well, there's a very different relationship between Mourinho and United's fans and Mourinho and Chelsea's fans, even at the time he was managing them. He's always been, he's been assiduous, Mourinho, in, in mm. continually saying how great the United fans have been. Yeah. Mm. Whereas he spent a lot of time criticising Chelsea's fans for being mm. too quiet yeah, yeah, yeah. throughout that second tenure. So I wonder if that plays into mm. it as well, the, the sense of mm. that he'd never really appreciated them. Mm. It, again, makes it harder to, to welcome him back. Absolutely. But you, that, that thing that, that the fellas were saying about, you know, the way that it's been, it's been lost, this idea of the returning player, there was a guy to my right yesterday who every time Matt touched the ball shouted Judas at him. And you're thinking, <laughs> they sold him. He yeah. didn't want to leave. They <laughs> sold him to Manchester United. He couldn't get in the team. It was nothing to do with him wanting to leave Chelsea. They sold him to Manchester United. How is he Judas? Mm. You know, how is he this disloyal figure, you know? But and, it's, it's, and he's, I think Matt is one of those... He's one of the nice guys of football. Yeah. He's, there's not, yeah, it's, it's hard, hard to, to get offended, offended by Wayne Matthews. It's not a bad yeah, bone yeah. in his body, mm. is it? It's not, it's not just a Chelsea thing, we should point that out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. City, City yeah, Liverpool, absolutely, two yeah. weeks ago, the City fans continually screamed greedy at James Milner, who left because he wasn't <laughs> playing. <laughs> yeah. we've, um, we've, got another, we've got another standing disciplinary issue, um, which is the charge relating to Mourinho um, after the Newcastle United game as he walked off, off the pitch, Sam. Um, Mourinho asked for an, another couple of days grace didn't he? because the international break well, clearly wasn't long enough to form um, his defence. <laughs> um, so he, he does have an, ex <coughs> does have an extra I'm couple of days. Um, where does this one take it? Where does this one take the FA? Is this a, is this a tricky one mm. for them? Words spoken yeah. in his native Portuguese yeah. tongue. It takes us into the realms of... Remember, remember the Suarez Evra, which was rather more serious, but they had to have experts in... Sort of, uh, sort of southern South American dialect. Rio, Plan Rio Platense. Rio Platense. Rio Platense. Mm. Rory, Rory probably speaks it. To <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, I mean, it, it, this is this is where we're at in 2018. The nuances of of um, of European languages far beyond the care of most 
football fans and football journalists, I have to say, apart from Rory. I mean, I, I, I don't know... I, a lot hinges on this gesture as well, and I don't know how much we can interpret that at this time in the morning before the watershed, but um, it, that seems to me to be pretty key to, mm. to the whole charge. I think it's fair enough that in, in a league that, is, has, that owes its success to its internationalism that you shouldn't... that swearing in Portuguese should be considered as serious as swearing in English because there's probably more Portuguese speak, speakers on the pitch than there are English speakers, <laughs> and there's people watching in Portugal and Brazil and Angola. There's, mm. there's Portu so that matters. I think the problem that the FA has is that I don't, I don't think it's a great legal precedent if you're allowed to swear all of the time except directly into a television camera. <laughs> that seems a weird rule to enforce. How, how, how offensive was it? Given the circumstances, given the, given the pressure, the circumstances of going into the game, Rory, it, assuming he read newspapers that, this, that morning before the game against Newcastle, was told about it, come what may, you're getting sacked, they're 2-0 down, they go on to win 3-2, the Paul, Paul Scholes continually criticising um, Mourinho. Was it that offensive? I, I, I wasn't offended. I vaguely, vaguely understand what it means, but it, I, I wouldn't be offended if someone swore into a TV camera in English. It wouldn't faze me particularly, but I'm not, I can't speak for the nation of Brazil. No. So perhaps there were lots of Brazilians who were offended. I perhaps don't know. there's it's, lots of complaints. It's, yeah. bad, it's naughty to swear. That, any, any parent will tell you that. It's bad <laughs> to swear. You shouldn't swear. I, I think in this situation, it seems... It but does it's seem, inevitable. It's inevitable. There's, everyone swears on football pictures all the time, and I, they probably shouldn't. And we maybe it's maybe something we, we do need to police a bit more stringently. Fans, players, the amount of swearing is is heavy. It seems strange to to say that most of it's okay, but the bits into the TV cameras and really not allowed. That's the problem. It's the inconsistency. What about Martin? When it takes, if we move this um, argument on, mm. when it becomes a bit more sinister. In what Chelsea saying? footballer Karen Carney. Well, yeah, with, the, the, yeah. with, with the with the um, Instagram posts that were directed mm. specifically at her, what what are our feelings towards that? This but, is this is we're talking about Mourinho's reflex response to beating Newcastle TV camera thrust in front of him. Mm. This is a different situation. Yeah, in look, terms of abuse. Uh, our feelings towards that. I mean, you almost not worth articulating because it's, it's quite obvious what yeah. you, you you feel about that and particularly vile abuse and. Um, and um, you know, it, it's it's a it's a social issue in terms of how much of, of, of that that sort of abuse is is, is permitted in, in in social media. The problem in, in in football terms is there is an abuse problem in football that has not been addressed, and it hasn't been addressed for a number of decades now. And so everyone lets it go and lets it go and lets it go. And now there are, are, are high-profile women footballers, and we're talking. Uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of black footballers, ethnic no, minority footballers. Homophobia is an issue within football now. And then so suddenly, you've got this level of abuse that is off the dial, and everyone now goes, "Oh, this is terrible. This is absolutely terrible." But actually. The abuse problem started 30 years ago, when, and, it, and, it, and it wasn't addressed then, and this is what... If you don't stop something, you encourage it. So, basically, they've let it slide, let it slide, let it slide, let it slide, and now this is where we are, where you've got this very uncontrolled, this really uncontrolled foul abuse uh, based on gender, based on race, based, uh, based on sexuality, and, 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 and it's... It's absolutely it's, it's horrendous. It, it's absolutely horrendous that you should that that Karen Carney, for instance, had to had to put up with that because she what because she scored against Fiorentina. Um, but the problem begins thirty years ago, and the problem is that we didn't address it thirty years ago, and now you're trying to put toothpaste back in the tube. Yeah, difficult to police. That, that's it's certainly issue. yeah, certainly a subject we like to uh, revisit at some point in the future on this program, that's for sure. OK, next up, um, we're going to talk about Manchester City. They're back where well, they want to be. They're on top of the table after that 5-0 win against Burnley yesterday. More on them coming next. I don't know how this is going to work because these boys have just had the grassroots debate in the break. <laughs> we're supposed to be doing it in part three, OK? Part two now. Let's talk Man City. Good reception for this man. Conceded five times though. Joe Hart uh, returning to Manchester City uh, yesterday with his Burnley side, Rory. Um, are we seeing... Uh, there was frustration, of course, with, with 
the way that uh, Burnley conceded their second goal yesterday, and of course Sean Dyche um, has, has talked about it, and so has Joe Hart said he got an apology from the assistant referee over it. The bigger picture for Manchester City is the manner of their victory, three goals they've conceded in nine games. Are we seeing an improvement on the side that everybody fell in love with last season? I think they might be better. Mm. I think they might be better than the side that had 100 points, which is a bit of a shame, to be honest, because I think we all fancy What if Pep had the coffee moment at the start of the season when he walked in and said, you can win it better? Yeah. It, it must be. It must be better. It must be. He, he, this continual drive for, drive for perfection. If you look at their underlying numbers, there was a great article in the Ringer uh, this week. If you look at the underlying numbers, they are outstripping everybody in terms of all the fancy XGs and XGA, the assists <laughs> prediction thing. They are Martin Stroffing. <laughs> the, um, the, the, the data suggests that they, are, they have improved, which is incredible. Now, obviously, that's dependent on they might collapse next week. You, you don't know. But certainly, if you look at the way they're playing, given that Kevin De Bruyne what, only returned for half an hour yesterday and, and is arguably their best player one on form, it's, they're going to take some stock in. That goal difference, the, the fact they won 5 0, whereas Liverpool only won 1 0, is significant. It basically means they're a point player already, and that, mm. is, that's, that may be important. Have you got these extra numbers on not the, on the top? <laughs> not on the top of my head, but they are, they are outstripping everybody. So the, the points total looks close, yeah. and it is close to the level, level on points, which is fantastic. Chelsea and Arsenal and Spurs are, st are still in, in touch. Underneath that, if you look at the, the number of chances they're creating, the amount of chances they're conceding, they are significantly outperforming Liverpool and Chelsea, which suggests that as the season goes, goes, goes on, they will get clear and potentially reach the sort of levels in terms of points that they did last season. Is, is there a danger of a sense of apathy in, among the rest of the Premier League where Manchester City play the way they do, these sort of consummate performances, they play with so much flair, so much control, they're in command of matches, Sam. Is there, an, is there a possibility elsewhere in the Premier League that there's almost gifting Manchester City victories, that it's Man City this week, forget it, not going to get anything there, let's move on to the next game? Yeah, I think, I think definitely. And <clears throat> you saw it with United in their golden years as well, where, yeah. where teams would, would almost write games off, really. And, um, essentially, they're playing, uh, they're playing Shakhtar this week, who were the first team to beat them mm. last season. And um, I spoke to their manager for a piece uh, last weekend, Paulo Fonseca, who's a Portuguese manager, who's sort of worked his way up the leagues and, and done a really good job in. Did you do it in English or Portuguese? Fortunately, for, for, for a monoglot like me, he speaks very good English, so um, he's he's definitely Premier League ready when the moment <laughs> comes. Uh, and he he actually that was a point that he made. He said, look, you know, we Shakhtar are a team that basically sell their best players every summer. He said, but one thing I said to the players was. Um, don't be afraid. We've got nothing to lose here. Let's let's try and play the way we play. Mm -hmm. And and they actually they happen to play quite a possession-based game. But I think I think a lot of teams uh, it, it's it's incredibly daunting, especially because you feel that once the first one goes in, then that you know mm -hmm. it, it, that's it really. And and that that's that's City are not the first. I mean, you know, the, the great Arsenal team of 2004 and, and both, both the sort of Fergie millennial team and then the, the Ronaldo Rooney team, they, they had that as well. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I think what, what you, you see in the development of a side, so when City were, were sort of uh, trying to become this great force in English football, they often used to lose games that you'd look at on the fixture list and think, how have they lost that one? Mm -hmm. But they don't do that anymore. And that's just another sign that they are, they've, they've gone up another level. Yeah. Do they have the, the, the cachet, Martin, that when you're going to a Manchester City game, that it's, it's a game that you're looking forward to? Oh, yeah. You know, uh, you know you're going to see yeah, something, without that. Without that. something special. Yeah, I think everyone was really disappointed with, the, with Liverpool Manchester City the other week because mm -hmm. they were expecting this classic and it was actually quite a doer sort of game. It was, it was the game you, you used to expect sometimes when you got the two best teams in the league and, you know, the old cliche about cancelling each other out and, and, and stuff. And everyone was disappointed by that because you expect to see Manchester City playing in this very, very expansive way. Um, and you look forward to you look forward to seeing them. And, and they don't end up chasing too many games, to be fair. You know, the, the, I think it was Teddy Sheringham's quote that the greatest sight in football was Manchester United chasing the lead, which was the old Ferguson, uh, the old Ferguson team. And, and, and that was true because you know, United would go one nil down, and then they'd have to get it back, or three nil down, as they, as they did at Tottenham that time, and won five three. City don't do that really. City are quite tight, actually. It's a bit of a myth that they can't defend. They're, 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 they are, they are tight, and they're causing teams so many problems that 
teams don't get at them the same way. You were really thinking that Mo Salah would, would, get, at, would, would get at Mendy um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. But he didn't because they tightened up in a, in a way at mm -hmm. the back and, and they brought they brought the centre half a bit closer to Mendy and there wasn't enough space to operate. Um, they're a much smarter team as yeah. well. Than, it's not just that they're beautiful football, they're a much smarter team than they're given credit for sometimes as well. It's not all good news for City um, on the back page of the Sunday Mirror this morning. They're talking about Raheem Sterling and his contract. City fear they'll have to sell um, the contract rebel they've taken to calling him. This is Simon Mullock's story. They're saying City won't pay him the kind of money, £300,000 a week, according to this story, the same as top earners like Kevin De Bruyne and Sergio Aguero. Is this in danger of becoming one of those long-drawn-out sagas and an unnecessary saga, Rory, or is it, this is the modern world, he's a big-name player, his contracts will eventually be resolved? I, I would still expect him to stay, but mm. I do think that City are running a risk, because there is... The fact that his contract's running down, the fact that he scored two very good goals for England in Seville last week, and the fact that Real Madrid can no longer score goals or win football matches might all sort of coalesce into... Real have been interested in Sterling for a long time. So they will be looking at that and thinking, this is an elite player that we can afford relatively easily. He won't cost £150, £200 million with his contract running out. So I think there is a risk. Sterling and, and his team are tough negotiators. I think City will be well aware of that from when they signed him. Uh, so it potentially could, could end up with them losing a very, very promising... Not even promising. They're one of yeah. one, potentially one of their best players uh, at a cut price fee, which is something that's not really happened to City since they they sort of emerged as, as the Premier League's elite team. So how they handle it will be really important. Which is the danger is, and we've seen at other clubs, if you start allowing everybody to match the top earners, then more and more players start mm. thinking, well, I should be a top earner too. Why, why, they, why would they play hardball over this? He's 23 years old. He's English, young player. When he's in full flight, he's one of the best players in the Premier League. Sam, why why is City playing hardball? Is it is it is it a line in the sand? Are they saying no more? Um, well, if they are, I don't, I don't know why they would do that because I think I think there's a slight, a slight bias against young English players in that respect. That you know, if, if you're a De Bruyne or an Aguero, oh, you know, just got to give them the money because they are these. Whereas yeah. actually, what Raheem Sterling is doing is is he's moving into that category. I mean, there's, there's nothing. And he, it, the Seville game was a was a really big moment for him. I mean, they were two great mm. goals against the top team. And I just wonder that, it, actually, in the interim, while they've sort of been dragging their feet, he's actually been raising his... His, his value's been going up. He had a great season last season. And I think, I think there is just an assumption. I, I think sometimes it's even slightly subconscious in these... Uh, amongst these sort of technical director cadre that, that you know, he's not quite, these, these English or these homegrown players are not quite top level. They don't quite command the, the big money, but... You know, Kevin De Bruyne's been out for six games, and City haven't really missed a beat, and and Sterling's been a big part of that. So, um, I, I I think he's in a strong position. I I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see him stay in this game. I think what Real Madrid are doing always right is that they're now looking at because they can't afford to pay the big one-off fees anymore. They're now looking, they're sort of using the, the the heft of their reputation and tradition, which is always a big play for them and they're, they're looking at players like Hazard who are coming towards the end of their contract yeah. so there's still going to be big fees but they're not going to be the, the massive kind of Ronaldo sized fees that you'd, you'd, you'd want to expect them to pay yeah. Do you not think they're also looking at it you've got Phil Foden who can't get in the team so you, you can go a certain distance on, on Sterling but then if you go right well this is our ceiling and if he won't take that well then this is our alternative Sterling leaves, which we don't want, but he leaves. This promotes Riyad Mahrez up the order. This then promotes Phil Foden up the order. We can suddenly start getting Phil Foden into games that, that we couldn't get him into before. You know, they, they, they've, they've got an embarrassment of riches at, at, at Manchester City, and particularly if this youth academy is as good as, as they keep telling everyone it is, and, and Phil Foden is the, is the first is the first off the production line of that, really. And they, you've got to, you know, Chelsea's, Chelsea's production line stalls because you can't get into the team. You know, you, you, you get to a certain level and then you, you can't get a game. Mm. If, if you're going to make the academy work, you have got to find room for the people who are coming through the academy. Phil Foden is, is the prime example of this. The only way that happens is if there is a 
natural wastage at, uh, wastage at the top end, which can either come through people retiring because that you know that's it, or moving on because they're you know, they're not good enough anymore, or from from a situation like that with Sterling, where they go right, well this is our ceiling, and if and if you can't agree that, well thanks very much. It's it's you know it's been great for both of us, and you know you go and and we'll look at we'll look to the academy and we'll look to Phil Foden. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be the worst thing to yeah. happen to English football to have a player at Real Madrid and then yeah. Phil Foden in the Manchester City team. Sure. Foden got 15 minutes yesterday as well, didn't he, in, mm. that, so, in that victory. And just uh, see the back hill. He did, yeah. <laughs> um, he can do it at the top level. Um, Sterling did it at the top level for his former club, Liverpool. They won yesterday at uh, Huddersfield. Mo Salah's had a quiet start to the season, but yesterday he's just showed signs, Rory, I think, that he was coming back to the level that he achieved last season. Do we know, do we have any particular reason why Salah had a quieter start to the season? Well, I think certainly from, from the Liverpool fans' point of view, there's a parallel with last season that it was it was after an international break in which he scored for Egypt that was a quite a crucial goal that took mm. him to the World mm. Cup he did score against the Swaziland although Swaziland now has a different name didn't realize this Ace Wattini, I think it's now called uh, direct from a corner which is not, not the, the international expert the mark of, uh, that might be wrong <laughs> and offensive I don't know New York <laughs> Times <laughs> got excellent fact checkers yeah, yeah. yeah. well Twitter Twitter the expert fact checkers <laughs> yeah. Yeah. don't worry about that we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll find out <laughs> the um but he stood direct from a corner in, on the international break, which is not the mark of a man who's short on confidence. Last season, he started relatively slowly and then caught fire after that international break. Liverpool fans will obviously hope that it's the same this time around. I think there's, there's lots of different factors at play. One is that I don't think he's playing particularly badly. Uh, one is that he tends to have about four people standing around him at all times. Mm -hmm. And the little I know about football, it's much harder to do stuff <laughs> when there's lots of people standing close to you. And the other thing is that Firmino and Mane, that, that sort of strike force, hasn't really caught fire yet this, this season. None of them are playing especially well. I suppose the positive sign for Liverpool is that they've turned into sort of Arsenal of 1990 and they're just winning lots of games 1-0, which is quite helpful. But you, I don't think there's any real reason to worry particularly about Salah being a flash in the pan. He won't score $40 at the end this season, but he, he should continue to score goals and he will continue to be a threat, even if it's just by creating space for the people. I'm not going to take any credit for this, because fortunately I've got a producer in my ear, Roy, <laughs> and you haven't, but it's the Kingdom, es kingdom of Eswatini that we were looking for. Yeah, Every day's a school day. What's their exactly. FIFA ranking? We'll come back to you. Uh, Sam, I want to talk about Jurgen Klopp as well, because there was a little bit, of, seemed to me a little bit of um, dissatisfaction among some Liverpool supporters. Um, going into the international break about where Liverpool were, were they, are they really going to challenge Manchester City this season? But when you look at where they are, another win for them yesterday, they're in, they're in good shape, aren't they? Why would there be any kind of rumblings of discontent or a few grumbles um, after, say, for example, the, the draw with Manchester City? I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd be astonished if they were. I mean, they, mm. it feels like they've been... There is as strong as they've ever been in the in the in what we might describe as the post league title years i mean yeah i mean oh God, we could do the rest of the show on the times liverpool have come close in mm -hmm. 2009 2014 i don't think they've 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 ever been better equipped for it and um they they seem to be a very um a club where i mean if if we're going to compare them to their old rivals united it seems to be a club where everything works well together from the ownership to the to those who acquire the players, to the coaching staff. I mean, Klopp seems to understand that. I think he's just done, it's his three-year anniversary, wasn't yeah. it, that they had recently? Mm. And it seems like they they really have, I mean, their recruitment has been really good. You've got to give them credit. I know they got a lot of stick over the first attempt to sign Van Dijk, but it's been pretty impressive, really. And mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that always strikes me about it is they sold Coutinho, they, who was really, I mean, their best player last <laughs> yeah, season. Yeah, yeah. I mean, up then, obviously Salah just took over, came from, came not from nowhere but but people seem to forget that they sold what would the previous season would have been their best player and mm. got to the Champions League final it's kind of extraordinary yeah. that so I don't think they've ever been better equipped their problem is they're up against this incredible mm. Manchester City yeah. team and and that's been that was the same in 2009 I mean they should have won a title then really and then and but United were just so good they just couldn't catch him mm. will it be the same this time I don't know I, I, it's not Klopp's fault that Manchester City have got the the best team in their history at the moment. Yeah, sure. OK, another win, though, for Liverpool yesterday at uh, Huddersfield City, of course, with a big win um, over Burnley at the Etihad. OK, next up, we're going to talk about uh, Wembley Stadium. We're um, due for about 15 minutes talking about this. I think we're going to need a little bit longer than that. We'll talk about it coming next.
Welcome back. Uh, it's going to be these guests' favourite part, I think, this morning. Martin Samuels with us from the Mail, uh, Rory Smith from the New York Times, Sam Wallace uh, from the Telegraph. Let's just remind you what's in the papers this morning, then uh, most of them reflecting on the incidents yesterday um, involving this man. Take that, Jose, in the Sunday Times uh, this morning. Chelsea's uh, backroom staff celebrating wildly after Ross Barkley's 96th minute equaliser. Good story, this, um, from Steve Bates. Shut up. This is Manchester United's hierarchy telling their ambassadors um, in the club lounges that they're not allowed to criticise Mourinho in their conversations with fans uh, during matches. Must be tough to keep quiet at times given their form at home this season. Sunday Express, Eden Hazard, he hits the jackpot. He's about to sign a contract at Chelsea worth £300,000 a week, according to the Express. Uh, bye bye. Uh, the Sunday Mirror, interesting take this, and it, it's certainly politically sensitive. They say that the Saudis, they're ready to launch a £4 billion takeover of Manchester United, taking on that story that um, started, emerged during the week. Uh, but bye bye, goodbye. This is Raheem Sterling and the contract standoff with Manchester City. We've just been talking about that. We haven't talked about this man much, but he got a good win yesterday, the opening salvo. Neil Warnock uh, off the mark with Cardiff City, uh, beating Fulham yesterday. He's pretty happy with that. Please as punch as you'd expect Neil to be. Um, we're coming on to this though. This is the Telegraph's uh, campaign. The grassroots game in danger of decay. This is their six point manifesto. Um, Friday's Telegraph, um, some of the um, points made in that uh, manifesto, an independent commission to look at football's grassroots um, funding and the future, a commission to investigate new revenue streams, a commission to look at all the best practices abroad, the FA to cut bureaucracy for the grassroots game. Good luck with that. And the FA to step up its drive for greater respect for referees. Um, and Ollie Holt's column in the Mail on Sunday this morning. Uh, Wembley is the equivalent of timeshare in Tenerife, he says in his column, um, and now we're stuck with it. Um, Oli, not happy that Shad Khan decided uh, to pull out a £600 million move to buy Wembley Stadium from the Football Association. Um, Oli says it's a big loss to the game, money that could have been spent on grassroots football. Sam, you're in agreement, aren't you, that Wembley Stadium should have been sold, should no. have been funded? Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I mean, I, I think there's strong arguments on both sides. Yeah. But, and, and people, if you, if, you oppose the, if you oppose the sale of Wembley, they immediately assume that you're irrationally attached yep. to a stadium that's only, what, was it, 11 years old? I, I don't feel that way at all. I know that the FA have only owned it for 19 mm -hmm. years. I accept all those things. My, my feeling, uh, twofold, really, I didn't think that the sums that were being offered by the FA, and I know, I know it was early days, but I, look, just looking at what the projected earnings from selling it, I didn't feel that it was as transformative as they claimed. I mean, we were talking earlier about some of the interest rates they were claiming yeah. that they could they could apply to this sort of um, this Model. pot of yeah. money. I mean, you know. They're, they're way off what Mark Carney is, is, is setting at the Bank of England. I don't know where, there was a, actually apparently one FA councillor put his hand up in the meeting and said, if you know where you can get these interest rates, please let me know because yeah. I'll put my pension on it. Um, but, th so that's one thing. I wasn't sure, I, I wasn't sure about the way that the FA would administer this. The FA changes all the time, the executive changes all the time. It would be very easy for this money to be frittered away and for one regime to blame it on the old regime and suddenly it's gone. So that was the first, the first issue that I had. The second I had was that I don't think that we should be, uh, we as the English game, should be selling the family silver to, to, to pay for the very basics. Mm. Now, we know that the Premier League, through the Football Foundation, does give money. None of, as Martin has written in the past, other European leagues don't do this. There is no trickle down from the Bundesliga or from, from La Liga in Spain. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I just think that, that there should be more. We, all clubs, all players, all fans start at the grassroots. And, um, and it just feels to me really depressing. I know this, the government has a stake in this, um, but in these, in these times where English football has never been, never been wealthier, to sell the one asset that the Football Association, in which we all have a stake, to sell its one asset seems to me to be uh, well motivated in that they want to sort this problem, but really absolutely the nuclear option, and I don't think we should have to do that. Rory? Well, my, my big query with, with the whole scandal was... Um, scandal's the wrong word. It's already word. a scandal. <laughs> Slight, con small controversy. Barkle, I think, is yeah. more, more of a barkle. Farago. The for, the, yeah. was, this, this bid from Shade Khan was unsolicited. It came out of the blue, and I think we'd all like to be the sort of person who can ring up and say, I will buy that for £600 million, <laughs> whatever it is. 
just on a whim. What was the FA's plan before that? That, that I think, is the crucial question. Mm -hmm. How was the FA going to solve the, the grassroots problem, if we accept that there is a problem, what, without that £600 million? If Shaheed Khan never makes that phone call, what, what have the FA got, got, got in their locker? What's their way to sort out, sort out these issues? And the, my, my other query is, what, what do people think the money's going to get spent on? And also, what do we mean, mean by grassroots? Is, are we talking about kids' football, which is hugely important for the, mm -hmm. the health of the game? Are we talking about kind of Sunday league? Mm -hmm. And as a Sunday league stalwart, I would suggest that is maybe slightly less important for the health of the game. The, the pitch people... How are the team doing without you today? I've not... Uh, my knees... My knees... I mean, I can't <laughs> play anymore, Sam. But the... The, the other thing... The other you should thing, think about going into coaching in one possible. It's that time, yeah. Neil, to be honest. Yeah. If you've got your badges... Or investment. <laughs> or it's so hard as a player. Investment. <laughs> or investment. You know, the, the, um, probably investment. People talk about pitches. That's not the, the FA aren't going to spend money sort of sending someone around to mow the lawns. They're, that's not the idea. Which is actually that's, what you need. Right? Which, is, you, which is actually you, you need what you need. An army of more lawn mowers. More yeah. lawn mowers. Yeah. But more, you've, more rollers. That's the councils. It's the councils who've been forced to sell off green spaces to, to, to developers to help meet their budgets. It's the councils who can't maintain uh, pitches in, in an era of austerity. It's not mm -hmm. just the FA. You, you don't have one big sum of money that can solve all these issues. As Sam says, the government has a stake as well and, and a role to play. It is outrageous that facilities can be so bad when English football has so much money. But the FA should surely have had a plan for that anyway, because mm -hmm. that's kind of their job. The, th the thing with it is, I mean, I've got three boys who are now in their early 20s, all of them play club football, all of them played schools football, all of them... You know, you, you're not going to solve so much of the... You know, lawnmowers would be really useful, you know, cutting the grass would be really useful. You know, we had games where there's a fella from the Essex FA peering through... They didn't have any grass on our pitch. Yeah, well, uh, no, we had up. too much grass on this one. Pe <laughs> he's peering through, the, peering through the railings to make sure that the other team and our team have exchanged credentials, so we've checked all the names. They're kids are as big as this. I mean, who, who wants to cheat in seven-year-old or eight-year-old football? He's peering through. In the meantime, the grass is up to people's ankles. You're thinking, actually... Instead of him going around peeling through fences, get on a lawnmower and, and mow this grass and we've got half a chance. A lot of this stuff, a, a lot of this, you know, you don't need a Wembley-style pitch for, the, for your local pub team. It's, you know, that's, that's a council thing and th there should be far more link-up with schools. There should be far more link-up, particularly, say, with private schools that have got fabulous facilities. Um, that go on you, say, on a, on a Sunday, where you can have a real... You can have a... You can have a real link with the community and, and things like that. You, the, the idea that you sell Wembley and then this is this panacea for, for, for everything, that, that your pitch... It's always, you know, everyone thinks it will be their pitch that benefits. It doesn't work like that. I mean, when the Olympics came to East London, Old Lautonians Hockey Club ended up with two fantastic Smurf turf pitches because they were the designated Olympic training centre. Cross keys, I think it is, cross keys, or cross something, or cross sticks, cross sticks, who is the, 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 the club two mile down the road, they didn't end up with anything out of it because, you know, the big van went past and it delivered the two Smurf turf pitches at Old Lautonians and it drove off to somewhere else. <laughs> and if, if you were playing hockey, you know, in Liverpool or Sheffield, it didn't make the slightest bit of difference. The idea, everyone thinks it would be their club, their facilities, their lousy changing rooms that would benefit, but... Actually, what it, it needs a far more um, coordinated link up at some sort of national level rather than suddenly this massive windfall and then you start throwing money at everything. The EFL, for instance, said it should be administered by the clubs. This would be the clubs that, you know, some of the clubs that they've spent the last two or three years suing for financial incompetence for 40 million quid. They suddenly, you know, Queen's Park Rangers are suddenly mm. going to be the, the, the great arbiters of where the money should be spent in West London, are they? You know, considering, you know, what's just happened with them in the Football yep. League. It, it wasn't joined up thinking. It wasn't joined up thinking. It needs a far more coordinated effort. Six, £600 million. Pounds. Jonathan Lou made the point yesterday in his column. Yeah, it's a lot of money. We accept that. But is it enough money? What happens when it runs out? Well, that, that's, a, that's a great question. It's, it's, almost, it's almost a bottomless pit. The, the, a lot of people say we want to introduce artificial turf, but I think probably everyone watching this has played on 
on AstroTurf pitches that really need replacing, and even private companies don't, who run five-a-side centres or whatever, can't do that constantly. You're not not many five-a-side centres I've played at where you think this is a great surface. There's no holes in it at all. Seven or eight years, I think Sam said earlier, they AstroTurf pitches generally last. Do you, do you then get into a cycle of having to replace them constantly? There's there's clubs, there's pub teams, there's village teams, there's regional teams, school teams, all this stuff using these facilities constantly all over the country. £600 million, my guess is, wouldn't go that far. It's £25,000 just to take one up, isn't it? Yeah, just to get them to take it away. Yeah, just yeah. To, yeah just to get it taken and away. Once it's it's eight years or whatever, it's 25 grand just to get it taken up. That's before you put a new one down. Yeah, and, and, and these are, I mean, we get into that 3G debate, but I mean, Holland, the, docu the Zembla uh, investigative um, documentary has found huge dumps of them. I mean, where the, the people don't know what to do with these no. pitches once they've been used. But that's a, that's another question. So when you, I mean, I've asked this question to all the guys, but when when you go to Wembley mm. on let's say match day, that match day feeling when you wake up and it's an England international or it's the FA Cup final or it's another significant football event that's being played at Wembley. How do you feel about going to the national stadium? Do you do you believe it is ours? You say that we're invested in it. Do you feel that way that, yes, this is, this is the home of English football? Um, I, I, I do enjoy Wembley, I, I, I have to confess, and I like the old ground as well. Um, I, I know people say, well, look, Spain, you know, they don't have a national stadium. Brazil don't have a national stadium. They move around, and, and, and I totally get that. It just, it just happened to be different uh, with, with the English game. I mean, it was never intended. It was one of those strange coincidences. I mean, the, it was built in nine, the original was built in 1923 for the Great Exhibition. It was prefabricated mm. concrete. A lot. It wasn't supposed to be there more than a few years. It mm. ended up, like, you know, 77 years. And, and I, I just think it, it's just something that happened to our game. No one planned it, but it's there. And, and it, it, it does have currency. It does... Um, it's worth. It's a tradition that's worth hanging on to. Is the way I feel about it, and I, I accept other people disagree. I, I know there's an argument that people say, well, look, you know, it's going to have to be updated and renewed, and the FA that will take money away from the grassroots. Yes, that's true. I just don't think that. I, I just don't think there can be another Wembley. You know, if Shahi Khan wants to build a stadium for his NFL franchise, it's going to cost a lot more than 600 million, and and I get that. It's not as simple to say we built it, or well, the FA built it for 757, therefore, we sh it, you know, property prices in London have gone up, it should be worth more. Generally speaking, the experts say that it's a metric of profit uh, before mm. tax times by 10, and Wembley doesn't generate a lot of profit as a, as a venue. Um, but to go back to your original point, Yes, I do. I do like it, but what I, what I feel most strongly is that it's it's one of the few assets in public ownership. You know, the FA is a public mm. body, and unless you absolutely have to sell an asset, I was always told you shouldn't. So that would be that would be my basic rule of thumb. And if there's an offer for it now, there will be an NFL franchise in London at some point, and <clears throat> and unless they're going to do a deal with Daniel Levy and and play there, Wembley's really the only other option. NFL supplement coming live. <laughs> we'll have but, to learn the rules first. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but, Rory, is it home for you? You you a Wembley match day experience? The nostalgia, the history, the heritage of the stadium, and we can look at past glories and the previous prefabricated building that Sam talked about. But is it home? It doesn't mean as much to me as the old one. The, the, as stupid as it is, the, the towers were, were what Wembley mm. was. The, the massive gap between the stands and the pitch at, the, at each end, that was what Wembley was. It looks different. But I suspect to a generation younger than me, Wembley probably means a lot. And I, the, other, the other great test of how much Wembley means are, are the minor cup finals, the, the Johnston's paint and the mm. checker trade and all the ones, and the FA Vars and what have you. I suspect to the fans of the clubs that have been there, they wouldn't want to lose Wembley. And that, that's really important because that, they're part of football too. Is it? see Lionel mm. Messi play at Wembley. Right, we've all seen Lionel Messi play at Wembley. It means something to Lionel Messi, doesn't mm. it? Because I've never seen him have anything less than a wonderful game mm. at Wembley and it, it's it's an inspiring place and it's has and you can say oh it'd still be Wembley if it was owned if it was owned privately yeah it would but it wouldn't be ours and this is ours I, I, I do believe that if you are a young footballer grows up dreaming of playing for England at Wembley he doesn't dream of playing for England in Leicester on a Tuesday night against Switzerland he, he, he doesn't I mean it's you know, this stuff, it's a myth about, oh, we'll take it around the country, it'll be fantastic, it'll be fabulous. It, we didn't sell out Leicester. No. We didn't sell out Leicester a couple of Tuesdays ago. The, so, Swiss, the Switzerland game, you yeah, still want, yeah. You know, 
it, it's a home. It, it's good that there's a home for English football. And yeah. to go back to a, someone, to, Raheem Sterling, of course, has a tattoo of Wembley. On the I know. I just wonder whether they should update it with all the buildings <laughs> that are now being. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, that's. I quite like. I think that's a great story. The the, the young boy that I agree. who grew up around Wembley Road, yeah. bike around the building site, yeah. and has that. He feels that connection with it. Yeah, he yeah. does. OK, uh, Raheem Sterling, we're going to talk about him next again because he scored against Spain in the week. Good win, massive win for England. We'll talk about that. It's coming next. Welcome back to the Sunday Supplement. Uh, ben and Cammy are up next with Goals on Sunday. What's happening, Ben? Morning, Neil. Morning, all. Uh, Morning. So, very interesting show today because Alan Pardew is going to be joining us, Cammy, isn't he? He is indeed, yes. The first time that he's spoken since he less left West Brom. Uh, so, it's going to be interesting to get his thoughts on what happened up there, whether he considers it the right decision to go there, uh, what he might do differently if he was to do it again. Mm, absolutely, yeah. And his wonderful record at Newcastle United now. Didn't have that much money to spend at the time, but... Rafa's not doing it now. No, what not quite. What do the quite. fans think? That's what we want to know. And, of course, you guys, I'm sure, have been talking about Jose and what happened on the touchline. Uh, Alan liked a little bit of um, entertainment on the touchline as well in his time as a manager. One or two problems with one or two managers, but that's the passion. Yeah. So I'm sure when it's manager like, to manager, it's... He'll have an interesting take desire, on that, won't he? Yeah. Uh, so, plenty coming up. We'll be live at 11 o'clock. Thanks, Ben. OK, let's move on to... Um, England, Spain, or Spain, England, uh, in Seville, Rory. I, I don't know why I'm going to come to you. I can't think of... Oh, actually, I can. Um, England's performance, uh, Martin Tyler said that it was um, perhaps better than anything, or the significance of the result, the pedigree of the opponent, was better than anything England did at the World Cup. You tweeted in the week that you disagreed with that. The World Cup, reaching a World Cup semi-final is a huge achievement. Making it that far, particularly, I guess, when you take into context England's recent context, England's recent tournament performance, that you have to take that into account as well. What, what did, why, why did you think? Why, why was that your view? So the performance, yeah. I quite agree with Martin. I think, <coughs> Martin, I think the, the the performance was probably, given the calibre of the opposition, was probably better than anything we saw in the summer. That's sure. quite right. Uh, one of, my, one of our colleagues accused me of dampening down enthusiasm over the results in Spain, which I would never want to be accused of at all. It sounds terrible. But I, think, I think we're in danger almost of overlooking what they achieved at the World Cup, and I know that We've it was... We've had a journal war for a while, haven't we? There's, <laughs> there's another one ongoing at the moment, I think. Excellent. It's good. It keeps people entertained. <clears throat> the, I think there's, in, there's a danger of, of overlooking what happened at the World Cup. They reached the World Cup semi-final. That beating a Spain team in transition, who coming off coming off a terrible World Cup of their own with a new manager, with quite a few players who were still slotting together a system that's been being tweaked, which is totally fair. Not not to discredit what England did or dampen it down. Or dampen it down is not the same as reaching a World Cup semi final. Whoever you beat to get to the World Cup semi final. So I agree completely with Martin that the performance was incredibly encouraging against a better standard of opposition than they faced in Russia. But the, the significance is, is nothing. As much as we are all converts to the nation's lead, still not quite got the same sort of cachet as the World Cup, I'd say. I, I think you're battle-hardened. I think you're a bit different to me. I think, I think you're, um, uh, you've sort of desensitised that... When, when those Twitter spats begin... Just generally. Yeah. <laughs> it, no, with, 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 with social media and Twitter, mm. when, it, when, it, when it kicks off, that, that you're... That you're there and say, okay, well, we're going to have this out. And uh, you, you, you're, I think you're one of the most prominent journalists who says, okay, yeah, you know what, let's, let's, let's talk this through uh, with, with whoever, whether that's somebody who works for Sky, whether that's with people who are watching the game, people who are at the game, other journalists. Well, no, people are happy to think I'm wrong. That's fine. It, it doesn't particularly worry me that I'm not claiming to be right. I just think there's a danger that, that we might overlook. English football's quite good at re rewriting its history to make itself either feel better about things that it shouldn't feel good about or bad about things it doesn't need to feel bad about. And I think the World Cup is in danger of slipping into that second category because we, we are now saying, well, it was the start of something, they lost the semi-final, they didn't play anyone of, of kind of oh. the, the, the top level. Ish. That doesn't matter. Mm. They made a World Cup semi-final. That is all that anyone needs to remember from the World Cup. So I'm, I'm happy to put my point of view across Neil and, and see if people agree, but if people don't, that, I'll, I'll survive. Yeah, no, no, I know. I don't, There's so I don't much British know. negativity around the World Cup. So much, so much ridiculous negative. People are never happy. We're like Goldilocks, you know. This, this, this. Oh, this. You know, this podge is too hot. This podge. You know, if we, if we'd got knocked out in the first round, if we got knocked out at the group stage or lost to Colombia on penalties, oh, it's the same old England. Well, we beat Colombia on penalties. Oh, we haven't played anyone yet. And then we beat Sweden, who we often don't beat. Oh, we still everyone's useless. And then we got beat by Croatia, who, if you, if you. 
know anything about football, there was always a good chance that was going to happen because they we haven't got a player like Luka Modric who will control the game, mm -hmm. control the pace of the game, control the tempo of the game. That was always likely to happen. Um, and, and, and yet it's, oh, we haven't beaten anyone, we, oh, we weren't this and we weren't that. It's, it's, we're never happy. It, it, we're never happy. You might as well, actually, you might as well sell the National Stadium and, 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 <laughs> and knock it all down and build a big Tesco's, because we seem a lot happier going around Tesco's than we ever are, you know, watching football, watching the national team. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, well, it's absolutely like right. they, they got to a World Cup semi-final. Have a look at Germany's run to get to the World Cup final in 2002 and who they beat in the, in the, in the semi and in the quarter. Was it the United States and South Korea yeah. yep. were their last two matches before the final? You didn't hear Germany tearing themselves apart going, oh, this is terrible, we haven't beaten anybody yet. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's, it's nonsense. It, they, they are really improving under Gareth Southgate. We are so much further forward than we thought we would be a couple of years ago. And the, the danger, actually, is that because of that Spain result, that that sense around England that, that this is a, the start of something, that, that they are a work in progress, which was one of the charming things. I didn't cover it <coughs> but from the outside, one of the, one of the nice things about reading the England coverage was that everyone seemed to keep their feet on the ground, which is mm. not the risk of, running, of offending all three of you, necessarily always the case. And the danger with the Spain results is that... You're not really it, American, you know. You're one of us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just because you work for the New York Times, you're still one of us. The, but the, the danger with, with the Spain result is that it, it, it kind of ends that sense of... Of perspective. It's the biggest result in UEFA Nations League history, but, 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 but It is, and that is a long and illustrious history. But they, they smashed the Germans 5 1 in 2001, didn't they? And then how did the, the, uh, the subsequent tournament go? It wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't mean anything in, in the long run. That was in qualifying against Germany in Munich. This mm. was, as, as Spain said, not, again, not, not, not dampening anything no. down, the, the worst thing a journalist can do. The, but it's a Spain team that, that didn't, what made the last 16 got beaten by Russia in in the World Cup, so they had a worse World Cup than England, whoever they played, mm. and then so, didn't have a manager, has now got a new manager, and is, is still very much kind result. of... It was, was a great result, result and it was, was a great performance. Result. And, and, and it was achieved in, a, in, a, in two very distinct ways, because the, the, you know, the first half of the counter-attacking and how, how smart we were about that and how well we took the goals, and then the second half, which was one of those old-fashioned sort of backs-to-the-wall type, you know, rear-guard action, which was, which was again, mm you know, good to watch. And, and, and they clearly play for Gareth Southgate. They clearly have bought in to, to, to what, he's, what the man's doing, which, yeah. is, which is, again, is very good. Not worth, subject, worth it for yeah. the dire tackle on Ramos alone. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Was, was that, that fun? To, well, no. No, mm. and I used to see that all the time watching football in the 1980s mm. as a kid. You'd be waiting for Brian Robson or yeah. Billy Bonds to do something like that to whoever they assumed was the biggest bully on the other <laughs> team. And it was great because everyone knew it was going to happen. Yeah. But the, I think the referee booked him just out of sheer shock that he'd, he'd done it because <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't happen in modern football anymore. No, it's the sort of thing... Ra and it, it, the other thing is, with it, it's the sort of thing you know that Ramos is more than capable of yes, doing himself, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I mean, Dyer had to have eyes in the back of his head for the rest of the game, but he got away with it. Yeah. Did Ramos not just say, well done to him? <laughs> um, one of the other issues, though, um, actually off the field, a lot has been written about England supporters, England's travelling fans. Um, um, uh, Daniel Taylor's written about it in his, uh, in his Observer column this morning as well. It's a continuation of a theme about England's behaviour. What can be done, and how do you feel about England fans travelling abroad? Um, yeah, I read, I read uh, Jack Pitt Brooks' piece in yeah. The Independent as well, and I, I completely agree with it. Um, I, I think there's, a, there's, there's obviously a distinction to be made between the absolute full-on kind of sort of st street violence that, was, that we saw in the worst times, and, and it's fair to say that banning orders, whatever your position on them, have, have changed that for the better. Um, but... It's just, I think most of the points that were made this week were about just, the, just this, the sheer kind of rudeness of it. I mean, it's so uncivilised to go to someone else's city and, and behave badly and to get drunk. And it, it, there's nothing wrong with getting drunk, that, that, that's, that happens. But to, to, then, to then to make assumptions about what you can do and to, and to kind of sort of mark out territory, which is a which is a strange sort of facet phenomenon, of England, it, phenomenon yeah. of England fans. And, and we're not talking about all of them, but some of them. It's this kind of... It's just basically being obnoxious. And it's, it's, it's a difficult one to police because being obnoxious is not a criminal offence. 
but it just seems to be something that, that England fans don't seem to do very well. They don't seem to, when they travel, there's certain parts of them don't seem to be able to behave themselves. And um, I think it's something about education, really. It's about well, I always think of the, the Dortmund game, um, Germany, England, the, Dor the Dortmund game. Mm. I think Danny references it in his, in his piece this morning when the England fans, and he just says it, it was incalculable the number of England fans who were singing the German Bombers song, which we know the words, so we don't need to, we don't mm. need to repeat them on this programme this morning. But that, that is an example. Why, that's why, the example why, sorry, that's the example I, I always think of. Yeah, I, don't, I just don't understand why a generation whose who's fathers would have been born after the Second World War are still going on about this. It, 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 makes, it just makes no sense to me. And actually, I'm sure, I'm sure that m my grandfather and, and the people and his generation wouldn't have dreamed of doing that in, in the aftermath of it because it was just, that was not something they wanted to revisit and, no. and times had moved on. I find the fact that a conversation not about uh, led, a conversation with a friend, l l sort of inspired by the the England fans piece by by Jack in the Independent that you mentioned about fans of clubs singing offensive songs. M my dad would never, who's not a Manchester United fan, would never have dreamt it would would have been appalled of uh, d the idea that people might sing about Munich, and yet fans do of other generations. Mm -hmm. People who were affected by it, I don't think, would, would ever make light of the Second World War, but it seemed to be gaining in popularity. The, what Jack's piece did really well, I think, was, was to, to link it to the kind of political and cultural context, I guess, in which we are operating. But I think the key line in, in Danny's piece today is that it's a stand do mentality. It's, it's not, it, it's not, they're not riots, then it's not Charlois 2000. It's, it's yeah. people kicking wind mirrors off cars, which is kind of the sort of the idiot on the stand do who t who'd gone a bit too far, yeah. to be honest. That is that sort of behaviour. But Sam's right, it's a unique, uniquely English thing. You go to a tournament, you never see Spanish fans colonise a square. They'll be in bars, they'll be drinking, they'll be having a great yeah. time, but they don't take over a square and say, this is ours, you no. can't come here. Which I think is the, the, the that territorialism is the real problem. Hmm. Ian Ridley um, said, I can remember, uh, whenever it was when we were in Italy, I think 1997, so it's 20 odd years ago, and he, and he made a point, I said, this is a very good point, that as long as, as, long as no one's dead, we think we've behaved all right. Mm. And, and that's absolutely true, you know, that, that, that as long as, as, long as it, there isn't actually physical harm, and it, we think that it's all right. If the locals are sort of... To, and, you, and you've got to remember, unless you are a country with a big drinking culture, and Spain isn't, produces great wine, produces great sherry, but it hasn't got a drinking culture the, the, the way a that we have got, a binge culture. drinking culture. Groups of young men on the street drinking and it, it, it's flipping terrifying to, to the locals because they haven't got an equivalent of that. Mm. Um, and that's true of a lot of Mediterranean countries. And I think the, 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 a problem is, in some cases, is just a lack of self-awareness, a lack of awareness of how intimidating and frightening um, a group of fans can look. Now, they might... They might See, you know, look at us. Oh, we're just having a, we're just having a laugh. We're just having a sing song or, or whatever. Well, yeah, of course they they know that because they're familiar with the culture. The people of Seville aren't. That's, that's, that's an issue. I, I fancied retiring to Spain as well, Martin. It's the mm. longest life expectancy in the world now. Yeah. Even more so than Japan. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> next up, we're going to talk about Unai Emery. Quite a revolution going on at Arsenal. They're looking for ten in a row tomorrow night against Leicester. Coming up next. Right, Martin. Um, Unai Emery. Yeah. Should he stay should or should he, stay he go? Should he go? <laughs> what are they going to do? Yeah, fly past. Give him a ten-year contract. <laughs> big player. And he's got too many. He's got too many attacking players, hasn't he? He's bought too many attacking players. Hasn't got enough defenders. Shareholders meeting. You want shareholders to go to meeting. Shareholders meeting. That'll be it's probably a shareholders meeting. No, he's, he's done fantastic, hasn't he? I mean, second game in the season when they played Chelsea and they got beat by Chelsea. And I didn't think you could put a cigarette paper between the two teams that day and, and he'd lost his first two games, Emery, and so had won his first two games. Everyone was going nuts about so. But when you looked at the two teams that day, you could see that Arsenal were just a work in progress like Chelsea, but I think they opened up with matches at home to Manchester City and away yeah. at Chelsea, so it, you, you weren't allowed to see, really, how much of an impact Emery had made. And since then, 
now you, can, now, you, now you can start seeing it. And there wasn't that much difference between the teams that day, and there hasn't been that much difference between the teams since then. He's, he's done a really good job. I mean, there should be players there that are looking at themselves, thinking, you know, Zaka suddenly, who now Zaka wants to be a central midfield player, which he didn't seem as he wanted to be when Wenger was there, mm. you know, in terms of putting tackles in and, 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 and doing the job properly. The Eric Dyer role. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, what, what Zaka used to do was kick somebody up in the air and get booked, and that, uh, in lieu of actually making, you know, the, a mm. proper con contribution in defensive midfield. Now he's playing the role properly. Um, you know, Emery's made a huge difference there. Yeah. He's made a really, a really big difference, and I don't know if in the mix for the title. I, I, I totally take Rory's point that City could just pull away from everybody. They're certainly in the mix uh, to get back into Europe, uh, yeah. get back into the Champions League. This is this is a big run they're on, though, isn't it? To to think that this is, it feels that he's done it very quietly. While we've all been talking about Man mm. City and yeah. Chelsea and Liverpool. Actually, very, very quietly, this guy's had a very good start to his career. And that's exactly what not only Emery needed, obviously, but what kind of what Arsenal needed after, I mean, what, five, ten, 150 years of talking about whether Wenger should leave? Yeah. And that sense that whenever they, they lost a game or drew a game or didn't win a game 3 0, they were in crisis. Mm, yeah. Arsenal really need, really need that serenity as a club just to, just to build. And I think for Emery, it's perfect. It's almost actually helpful that he did have those two diff difficult games right at the start and then this slightly kinder run. Mm. in which he could start to build a bit of momentum. I think they play Liverpool in two or three mm. weeks, which will yeah, be a good test a, of how a, far a they've come. Game, yeah. But for the club as a whole, I think, just this idea that the season's ticking along nicely is really important. And because United, and to a lesser extent Tottenham, haven't maybe uh, been as flawless as we would, we would expect, they are. I think they can look at the Champions League as a realistic target for the season now. Aren't yeah, they? certainly when Manchester United are, are slipping up as well. Sam, I'd like to touch on um, uh, Wayne Rooney, because you went to see him um, a couple of weeks ago <coughs> in America, flourishing, revitalised in his new career with uh, DC United. They play New York City today, don't yep. they, in uh, MLS. They can confirm all their, their place in the um, end-of-season playoffs today. How did you find Rooney, the 2018 Rooney in, in Washington? I found him in the dressing room, <laughs> which is amazingly where you're allowed to go in, yeah. uh, in American sport. <laughs> uh, no, how did I find him? I found him content. Yeah, I was what, you, what was that experience like? Sorry, sir. What was that experience like? It's really like? weird. I mean, you, so you, you go down there and everyone... And I was quite excited to see what a dressing room looked like in the aftermath of the game. Yeah. And uh, uh, the Americans are pretty laid back about it. They go, you know, they're, they're in there all the time. And uh, so there's like a period, there's a grace period where you um, you wait outside for 10 minutes and then in you go. And there, you know, there was, um, there was actually, because Wayne Rooney was, uh, was in demand, there's a little annex off, so he came through and chatted to us there. But um, yeah, I hung around a bit after, had another chat with him later. and. Yeah, right. he, he, there he was, putting on his socks and his shoes and getting ready. And one of his sons was dribbling the ball around the room, and his teammates were there. It was, it's a, it's, it's totally different. I mean, uh, it's their their culture. I, I, it'll never happen here. We know that. But but he was, um, he, he was very content. I was dubious about it. I had to say, I just felt that he's such a good player and so young. Yeah. Um, okay, it, it didn't work out, Everton, but I felt he could. He could stay, but he's made a great success of it. He scored some great goals. Yeah, as well. he certainly has a great one in the week. Yeah, OK. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. We'll revisit Wayne Rooney at some other point, of course, uh, during the season. OK, thanks very much to the guys. Thanks to Martin, to Rory and to Sam for their company this morning. Lots of football coming your way. It's all on Sky, of course. Everton against Crystal Palace. That's today from 3.30 Sky Sports Premier League. It's followed tomorrow night, Arsenal against Leicester. Again, Sky Sports Premier League. The goals, uh, Sky Sports app. Watch the in-game goals and the highlights on your mobile phone. As we know, Ben and Cammy, they're coming next. Alan Pardew will be in the studio with Ben and Cammy. That's next. OK, don't forget, you can download the podcast from all the usual places. Catch up on demand. We'll see you next week at the usual time. Same time, same place here at 9.30. See you then. Bye-bye. Sky Sports. Feel it all.